Great. All right, so I'm going to turn the floor over and we'll get started. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I started this about 15 years ago when the reservoir was maybe 99 years old. I didn't realize it then, but after digging through a lot of postcards that I collected, and that goes back to another story. I used to trot fish the Esopus all the time and found postcards of the construction of the reservoir in antique shops. And I said, wow, these are great. And then digging a little further, found postcards of the construction. They cost a little bit more, and, uh, but that time they were maybe five, 10, $15. Now they're going for a hundred, hundred and a half, but they're, uh, they're hard to get, hard to find. And if I bid on, on eBay, there's somebody else who's bidding for it as well. So the question is how high, how much money do you want to spend? But that's what is used to make this whole thing come together. So I, I put it together for the hundredth anniversary. And then I've had other people talk to me about how about showing it at our church or do this. And it's been fun going through it and describing it. And last spring, probably in January or February, I said to my wife, I think I'm gonna turn this into a book because I had the whole outline in PowerPoint. So she said, you're gonna take a lot of time, aren't you? And I said, probably. She said, well, what's gonna get done around here? And I said, probably not much. <laughs> and it was true because I contacted a couple of people and then I, caught, I had a bunch of these Arcadia books around a pic, and I said to them, I contacted them, would you be interested in this? And they answered back in about a week, oh yes. So they, they published it. They have a very strict set of guidelines and the worst one is the captions for the photo, the images that are there. No more than 75 words, complete sentences, and no less than 50 words. I'm an engineer. I don't write in complete sentences. So it was a pain in the neck doing these captions, but it came together. But at least I had all the photographs. I knew the stories behind a lot of them. A lot of them needed more work. And thank God for the internet, I was able to find most everything I needed. And that in some of the local libraries, town of Olive Library primarily. So onward. That's the book, you've, you've seen it there, so we won't talk about that. A little bit of photographic history. I did this for the photo club in Kingston. And remember, there was a time not everybody had a camera in their hand. With your phone, everybody's taking pictures of everything, movies and all. And the income was pretty poor. You worked a lot of time, so you didn't even have time to take photographs, let alone print the darn things once you had a negative. But the real photo postcard, a photographer would go around, take pictures of things, and sell a real photo postcard because he could go home at night, print the images, and sell them the next day or two after they were done. So they were really easy to get out. And when the reservoir was being done, they were able to put these out in the stores around the reservoir, around Kingston, and, and even on the commissary at the, uh, at the reservoir itself. So in 1903, Kodak came out with roll film that was the exact same size as a real as a postcard. So it was contact printing. Your guy could, you didn't need an enlarger, you could make the pictures and work it real fast. So the photographers made three different kinds of postcards. This is a, a real photo postcard. This is a litho and this is a litho. But these guys printed a red letter for the text on the top. I have no idea who did that. There's a guy by Long Ear, name of Long Ear who lived in Kingston. Now, if you know Kingston, Clinton Avenue is on the north, on actually the east side of, nor, of the north part of the uptown Kingston area, right above the, the old railroad tracks for the UND, used to go right by there, up to Brown Station, up through the valley and on. And they ran five trains a day each way. Well, Bill Longer, who could gather his equipment, jump on the train, 15 minutes later, he's at the reservoir, take pictures all day long, ride home about mid-afternoon, mid contact print all his stuff, and he had postcards to bring up the next day or two. And this is where he lived, all right, pretty much uptown. John Street is on the other side of where he lived in uptown Kingston. Board of Water Supply had their own photographers, and some of these pictures that they had are, well, they're all in their archives, and some are on the uh, New York Public Library website, and you can find some of those. 
the litho series, they're printed like newspaper pictures on not very good cardboard. But, and they did a series of from 101 to 149. I have almost one or two, but one or two of those. And this was an early lantern slide that the uh, New York State Archives had. And it's just a beautiful view of the reservoir, not long after it was completed, the aer aerators and all going through the dividing weir, the upper basin and the lower basin. There's three foot difference between the upper and the lower. This is a sediment basin. The stream came through very loaded with clay and that all settled out in the upper basin, clean fresh water going into the lower basin. Okay. Can anyone on can anyone on Zoom see the large picture? Because I'm only seeing a very small picture. Can anyone uh, comment? Yes, yes. I'm only seeing a very small picture. So Donna, I think you need to share your screen. Do I? All right, I can try that. <laughs> okay. Um, I was able to see it. Maybe I you need to. A, I can only see a very small box. You need to pin the screen of the speaker. <laughs> Go to the top right corner. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how to pin the screen. That's the problem. So you see everybody, oh, right? Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Go I got. The... I got it now. Thank you. Is that better? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I think so. All right, so th these just give you some numbers about the project. And I'll talk a little bit about a billion gallons of water when we get to the end. I'm kind of a numbers guy and big numbers fascinate me. So just to get a picture of what a million is, and, I'll t and we can describe that. Okay, this is a valley piece of an old map. This is the UND railway coming up from Kingston. First West Hurley, Ashton, Brown Station, which was really the center of activity. The camp was near there, across the creek to Olive Bridge and all the way up to Boyceville, then on out into the uh, hinterland. The reason they built it, the reservoir here from another other set of problems, but the area was an ancient seabed and all the strata in the ground is very, very flat. I don't know if you, looked at the geology of the Hudson Valley, but it is really a mess. The eastern part of the county of Dutchess County, the rocks are going this way, there's thrust faults, there's all kinds of problems with the direction of the flow. In the eastern side of Dutchess County and Ulster County, there's all kinds of rocks right along the river that have, that have been convoluted, they're curved up and down, and there's no flatness to any of this stuff. So finding a place that's going to be easy to build a dam and not leak anything along the fault lines was the main reason they built it in the valley. As they were digging the uh, reservoir, they had to dig out all the, the clay and everything. They found this creek bed from the uh, Beaverkill Creek. And it, in order to get down to native rock, they had to go down 80 feet in here. So they had to build a, the same technique to cover the beaver kill as they did handling the Esopus Creek, which was major. And this is the valley again before that 30 foot deep of silt and sand and various ty types of materials that had been washed in by the glacier as the glacier melted away 14, 15,000 years ago. So, okay, the hamlets are, are all alphabetical, and we'll talk about those. Had roughly 2,300 people live there, all basically self-sustaining lifestyles. The big business were the farm ladies that maintained boarding houses. Cost $5 a week to stay there, a little bit more if you're going to have your meals. And they'd come up in fancy clothes, and you'll see some of these pictures. And that primarily brought in a lot of the money to the hamlets. There was all kinds of industry there, doctors and a little bit of uh, nursing capability. And, but you're only about uh, 20 minutes by train from the city of Kingston if you needed it. And that train went by four or five times a day. This shows the route 
again through the valley and the towns that are there. And we'll take a look at them alpha, uh, by order of leaving Kingston. And that's what we, I did in the book as well, the, the various towns and a couple of pictures of each. This is West Hurley. Look at the bluestone sidewalks, but mud roads. And uh, Ashton was just a sleepy little community, mostly farmers. Brown Station was probably the largest of the communities. This is the post office. And this is the covered bridge that crosses the creek. Remember the talk a month ago, the lady showed a picture of the mill that was right here. It's just beyond, right at the falls. This is the pulp, the pulp mill. These guys were in operation about three years before they had to close, but they made ground up wood for dynamite. And they worked 24 seven, all the time they could, uh, had good weather and had water flow through the mill. I'm trying to find more information about it and there's not a lot to find. This is Broadheads again, a sleepy little farming community and Shokan and West Shokan was probably the largest of the communities as you go up the river up and going up towards Phoenicia. They had uh, uh, fast, the first three Eagle Scouts in New York State came from the troop that was here in uh, West Show Camp. So a little bit of timeline. The Board of Water Supply said, okay, we're going to build this thing, survey and figure out exactly where you're going to go. Well, it seems like a very short period of time from 1999 to May of 1900. They, but they, uh, there was a water company, the uh, from New Jersey, who wanted to put two dams up there and they'd been through that whole area surveying it. So Board of Water Supply said, okay, we'll buy your work and we'll look at it and we'll see what we can do. They sent some surveyors up to the basin and they said, yeah, this looks like the best place. We can't go to Connecticut because we can't get New York water out of Connecticut. This, the area in Dutchess County is very clay and the waters don't run that, that clean. We can't get enough volume out of water. So out of here, they figured they could get five to 600 million gallons of water a day. So not a problem. Started construction in 07, 13, they sealed the dam, which is immense work. In 14, the, the dams were, and all the, the dikes were complete so they could contain water in both basins. And 1916 was a full capacity. There were a lot of concerns about never getting capacity, but uh, that was not a problem. The couple of the towns were moved to higher ground. Some towns were abandoned like Barron Station and Ashton. The contract to clear was in 07 and by year end 13, everything had to be cleaned out. All standing vegetation, trees and everything, uh, stumps were grubbed out and pulled and burned. So all the buildings were moved away. And there's some great tales. Uh, Bob Studing wrote a wonderful book, uh, Last of the Handmade Dams. And there's a great tales about uh, some of the things about moving buildings and all in there. 2,600 bodies had to have been moved, 40 cemeteries, they all picked up and moved to higher ground. The people in the village or in the towns made money moving the bodies. If they it didn't have anybody to move, the Board of Water Supply moved them up to a cemetery, uh, another cemetery. And I'll show you a picture of that. And the 13 miles of UND track and all the utilities, power lines, phone, and all that, all had to be moved out of the basin. So the board of uh, legislatures uh, said to the city, the state, we have to have a law that'll allow that. And the legislature passed a law in 06. Sam Quakendall said this, and I don't know why he said that, because he ran the UND Railroad, and the UND Railroad handled everything that moved up during the construction. So he made a lot of money on this. There were a lot of public hearings held, a lot of formal complaints. And as uh, Ms. Breeslaw said a month ago, there, nobody got paid the fair amount. Nobody did. The Board of Water Supply were the tightest people going. There were, set, there were three commissioners on a commission. There were seven commissions. Each commissioner at that time made $50 a day. They were, their job was to not give away any of this Board of Water Supply money. And they, and they did a very good job of it. 
And it was only maybe 20, 25 years ago, the last of the court cases were, were settled. It, it's kind of sad, but Board of Water Supply kept records. They took pictures of every single building that was there, of their water, uh, a wagon house. And this is, whoops, what they put on it, on the back, come on finger, who owned it, where it was. And in the process, they surveyed every single property, every single plot of land. The surveyors that worked for Board of Water Supply surveyed that entire basin to five foot increments over the entire basin. Also had to determine what si type of soil was underneath the, the land as they were doing that. These are the guys who were the lead engineer. Freeman on the left was a contractor for the Board of Water Supply for a number of different projects. Waldo Smith was a lead engineer, graduated from RPI, no, excuse me, MIT. And during his years at MIT, his training to be an engineer, he built dams around the Boston area. So he, and then Stearns and Burr were both professors of civil engineering at uh, Columbia, and he was at RPI. So they had some skilled people in order making the right design decisions. And as we go through this, you can see that works out pretty well. So here's the, the dam through here. The Esopus Creek comes down the middle and the Beaverkill Creek crosses through this dike area. They had dikes in various areas to dam this all up and hold, hold the lower basin. The upper basin had no need for dikes. A Little bit closer detail of the uh, creek, the dam area, and all the railroad that ran around through there. So when the reservoir started, they contracted with uh, George Winston Company, who owns Winston Farms up in Saugerties, or at the time. They, they came in, they built all the lodging for the workers. They built the commissary and the, and the buildings. The uh, Board of Water Supply provided some of the people for operation, but most of them were all supplied by the con by Winston contractor. A lot, he was working on the Kensico Dam, so a lot of his people came up with him there, the, a lot of his cooks and that sort of thing, the, and a lot of the laborers, the uh, people who do horseshoeing and making harnesses and that sort of thing. And But the main thing was to build the dam and the dikes, and the dikes were probably started almost at the same time as the uh, the dam was. These are the dam, the bank. That was an interesting building. Upstairs was a pool hall and barber shop. And uh, the bank ran the lower couple parts of it. The hospital had a couple of nurses and a doctor and a standby doctor. Police protection grew as, as the reservoir came, as more and more people came. And this is the contractor's office. I've not seen, uh, I know roughly where this was, but uh, I don't know where the Board of Water Supply had theirs offices. Okay, this is the main dam. What you're looking at inside here are stones. And they built this con the dam with a technique called cyclopean concrete. They would put down a bed of masonry, very tight mix, and set a stone in it, joggle it in place, and let it cure. And then they, there was maybe two or three feet over to the next stone. And they would do that as they built up. The stones acted as a key in the, in the masonry. So they didn't have to have any problems with uh, letting it cure. As some of you know, concrete gets hot as it cures. So here they're not making any great big thick pores. The, the stone helps absorb some of the heat. And they were able to work in... Uh, from above freezing weather until freezing weather hit again in the fall. They also built a cutoff that went down 40 feet below the bottom of the bedrock. And here they, they dug down until they could find fault-free stones, no loose stones at all. That had to all come up until they could find good plain surface on the bedrock. And then this soil is banked up against the dam on all places of except for the center of the dam. If you went up to the dam and stood over the, and looked down where the esophagus comes out the bottom, you're looking down a little over 200 feet. 
and that's that's visible. There's also inspection tunnels in here, in the bottom, and there's one one picture I have of a contractor where they're looking. I think they're waiting for the top dome of the uh, form to come in. Okay, so what was done was to get rid of all the soil on the top. This gray material over here, in here, is clay that's been pulled up from the subsoil and making room to get down to the, the bedrock in this area. And that started as soon as the contractor let. I was told by a gentleman here who Donna put me in touch with about a wagon that is back behind the barn here. This is one of those wagons, it's a dump wagon. And it was pulled by a couple of mules and the driver could open the lever and the soil that was inside it, the clay, would pull out as he was pulling along and it would get distributed rather than just dumped in place. And that was then it was rolled down hard and packed so they could put it up. And that's just storage. When they put the dam back together and it completed, they rolled and packed that clay again a second time. Okay, this is how they handled the Sopus Creek. They built, this was done before the contracts were, were let for construction. So this was in early 07. They built a coffer dam up here to get the flow of water on, onto the south side. They uh, put in coffer dams so they could build up piers. And this is a little piece out of a blueprint that shows the pipes across here that went, would get laid in place. They were 40 foot, eight foot in diameter, 400 feet long, and it took two of them to handle the, uh, the worst case flow that they needed during the time they were working. Here's the inlet up at the top with a coffer dam, and the bottom, this is the work area that they, they had. These are those piers that were poured to hold the, the pipes in place. This area is where they put the foundation for the dam, so that had to be dry. Now, OSHA is not here. If they, they were here, these guys would be all dressed in yellow, wearing hard hats and heavy boots. And, yeah, right. But here they are, guys off the street being hired. A lot of the people that came up to work were Italian. The, the, the tremendous Italian immigration at the time. And they, had, they were asked if they had a job. And if they said no, then they were pointed to some Italian folks that were standing nearby who shot them the right, right up to the reservoir. Couldn't speak English, but the people in the, uh, the seekers and all taught English to all the Italian workers because the definitely not the, uh, the engineers and the bosses could speak Italian. So they had to learn the, at least the basic words of, of uh, getting along. But this is the, the rock, no dynamite used, all done with air jackhammers with compressed air. And the compressed air was run as far as three miles to uh, run all these air hammers. And so they, they just kept pounding away, breaking these pieces out. Here they're stacking some of the stone, saving it for when they start putting the, the masonry back together again. Again, digging into the, the wall so they could get good material, good solid base. And you can see how that strata is all horizontal. Here's that bridge from way in back, the covered bridge at the dam. This is a steam engine, one of five, of three that were brought up from power plant. One of the power plants came from uh, the Kensico Dam. The other was uh, brought in to uh, be used. They had DC electricity, they had two dynamos. This produced steam engine and the steam produced compressed air through this area. Burned 1,400 tons of coal a month. And, and Quakendale's railroad brought that up. Here's a look at the, doing the cutoff trench. This is the upstream wall, downstream wall. I don't know why this is low, but it just wasn't built as deeply. But they cut down through here. I have no idea what these guys with straw hats on, but they're they may use some of the uh, inspectors from the Board of Water Supply making sure they're getting down 
to where they need. They also grouted. If there was a fault in this rock, they would drill it in 40 feet and pump grout into that to seal it up so there were, no water was flowing into this. This was a true cutoff. No, no moisture will flow through this, this cutoff area. And then the cyclopean fill being brought back up. Here's those pieces of rock put in place. This, the posts uh, tell you that this is a fairly new stone and it hasn't set in place yet. And as they keep working, they would work their way up. Another stone would go in here as he's cured. These are guys working, but the film back in those days was so slow, all you had to do is move a little bit and you were a blur. So you never saw any, any people. Here's some derricks that are up on the top that moved all that, the stone material. Here's the first block set. Now, the form of this dam, if you vaguely remember the drawing, there were blocks that were, were made. There were about 200 different kinds of block that were poured in, in advance of the build. So they had to cure about six months before they, they were used on the dam. So they built the poured masonry up to here. Then they put these blocks in place, cemented those just like giant bricks. And then they could pour the cyclopean masonry behind it. And they, they were hauled in with, this is with a, uh, an overhead crane, dropping, holding that block in place. They were eight, 10 tons each. This is the bedrock. And here you're at uh, 390 feet for the, the base of the dam. These are the, uh, pipes that are controlling the water flow. I was always curious about how they managed to get the dam built and the pipes out and have everything work properly. So they poured enough masonry. You can see the shape of a pan here and the long trough through the middle and the coffer, coffer dam at the top. So the water is still coming out this way. And then when they had that under control, they took the pipes, the tubes out and let the water flow through here and off downstream. But at least they had a dry area to work and they could work this area and continue on with the uh, buildup. Now I mentioned the, uh, the lithograph cards. The, this is one out of that series, number 107. And it shows the block yard. These are the different kinds of blocks that they made. And there were guys making these well in advance of the start of build so that they were ready whenever they needed a particular set of blocks. And the engineers had to cue the block building up to the dam to get the right blocks in place and all without computers. So here's the quarry, the oak quarry, the tracks went over a, a trestle across the stream three miles over to here, where they took a, a big quarry hill and crushed a lot of stone, all the aggregate that was used in the, all the, all the masonry, as they were building block and for the early uh, pours for the cyclopean masonry, where it came from over here, crushed rock, probably two, two inch, three and a half inch pieces that was brought back here to the cement plant and they more made the cement and that was hauled over by cableway into the dam area. That, this is the dam, these are wings like dikes that were used to extend it. <coughs> so this is the conduit, here's the water flow through as it was running. They built up with pre-made block, precast block there, all this face and, this, and the blocks that made the face of the dam. We were up there Oh, September, I guess my brother was here for a while and took him up to see the dam. There's cast, the cast blocks at the top are barrier walls across the top of the main dam. In the other places, they had a bluestone walls that were removed, removed and they put in uh, regular guide barriers on that area. But those, that piece of stone, it's this high, probably six, seven feet long and maybe two foot wide. 
that stone, that masonry, it's worn a little bit. Some of the aggregate is showing at the top, but you can stick there and pick it with, with your finger and that the aggregate that's there is not loose. They did a great job with the masonry that they made. And it wasn't Rosendale cement, it was cement that came from the Aslan plant up in, in uh, Catskill. Then they had to, with this, they had to build a, a bridge over the top of that, there's my pointer, and then make that strong enough to be able to continue building the dam. This is at the same level as the stream flow. I believe it was 360 or 390 feet of, above sea level. Then the top of the conduit, you're looking down the length of the dam from south to north. You can see the, the structure here that had to go in before they could build forms to pour concrete over the top of this. And that's the top of the arch of the, of the conduit. And that's 40 foot wide and 40 foot high to the flat, to the center of the curve for this curve. And then another 20 feet for the radius of that. So it's a pretty good size opening. These are the Linkerwood traveling cableways. These were used on the Panama Canal. They used a couple of them on the dam in uh, Massachusetts that uh, Winston built. And they have four of them working here. At one time they had seven in operation for the dikes and all because it's the easiest way to span a long distance. They carry a 15 ton load and they can move it a thousand feet per minute and stop and lower their load. So it, it's a very good, very structural, strong member. The only thing they bought from Lingerwood were the operating heads. On the other end, there was a, just a return set of cables or pulleys. All these timbers were all cut on site and built. Here you can see skips full, probably full of masonry, concrete to go over and uh, be used on the dam. This is a little confusing chart, but it shows you how the dam was built. Here's the, it's a compressed view, so that this is really 40 feet wide as well as 40 feet high. So it was built in sections, and these are actually expansion joints. We'll talk about that in a bit. And they built it starting at the south end, working to the north. So they would di use different part number blocks as they were going up through kind of like super Lego blocks. And this is the amount of earth that had to be taken out. Here was the bottom of the cutoff at 360, the, the bottom of the, uh, of the conduit is at 410, I believe it was, 400, about 410. And then the top of the dam was at 620 feet. So the end of, to, uh, 20, uh, 1910, this is what was on site. And the miles of railroad track, they just kept throwing in more and more track. And a lot of it was, uh, was narrow gauge. So they could use it for, and that's easy to pick up. You can do it with a derrick and just move it as, and where, wherever you want to go with it. So it was not too far to go. The uh, rolling stock, a lot of locomotive. These are not big locomotives. They're just the little donkey engines that are hauling small loads. But they did three shifts during the working period, two shifts building and one shift supplying all the blocks to the working area. So they didn't have to encumber the, the cableways by that were hauling masonry. The, block, the stone was there and the, the blocks were in place on the dam so they could continue working two shifts. Again, a little bit look, better look at the masonry technique. So here you can see these guys are shoveling masonry around these stones that were added. And uh, this is the, out, the downstream face of the dam. You can see how they line up and the, uh, the blocks in place. This uh, slot here is made for the ability to lift them, pick them up with a heavy steel bars on both sides and, and underneath. And then when they're in place, these grooves are filled with grout. This surprised me. I was, the internet has great things. You have to just 
have some time looking, but I found this Red Hook Journal brought out of a little weekly paper from Red Hook that had this article. Average a, th a thousand barrels of cement a day was brought over. Now I don't. I've had mixed review reports on what how they were shipped. Some people said barrels. Other people say bags. I, I'm not sure what they had, but it, they still brought a lot of cement. Yeah. So again, the uh, the, the uh, conduit as it's getting finished. Here you're up near the top. Here's the top of the finish wall. This will all be closed in at the in 1913, and they're continuing up the slope. Here's the cableway with a load of probably masonry pulling it off to the job. Now I mentioned the size of this conduit. This is in the spring. This is 40 feet across. This is a 20 foot arc, 40 feet high above. This is the esophagus in the winter time. So there's a lot of water running down through there. Now the expansion joints. This is, shows a graphic what it is. This is in detail of the, uh, I had to enhance this picture a little bit to bring this out. But here you have the typical running bond that you lay two blocks and stack another one above it. And here is where the joints meet. The, these are blocks that run back across the wall, across the dam to act as a key and hold that dam together this way. But it's, they can slide back and forth this way because you're talking about a dam that's roughly 1600 feet long and it's concrete and I calculated out the coefficient of expansion. If you didn't have them, you would have almost nine inches of compressive stress on that dam. And it had to be compensated for it in some way, shape or form. So by doing this and coating the finished wall here with a layer of grease, kind of like a real poor quality Vaseline, and then pour concrete against that, that uh, pre uh, prevented the, anything from cracking. This is the top view of that expansion joint. Here's the upstream side. The, the finished blocks went along here. Now you also notice they had different blocks keying into here, which again acted as a key to hold the masonry together. So this block, the wall was about 300 feet at the bottom when they started. And at the top, it's in the 40 foot range. But there was this well and everything built up together. This is a drainage well. And any water that did happen to sneak through here would get caught in this well and no water was visible on the downstream side of the dam. Here's a little bit better view of the lubrication. They would coat the wall with very heavy grease. And as the uh, masonry was put up against it, it would cure and it would allow it to slide. Nobody ever could see it because you're talking about micro inch movements, but that's what happens. And this is a structure as you get to the top. So you're 26 feet across in the finished area. And the blocks that I was leaning on sat on top of this ledge here. And this is a uh, inspection joint or tunnel, really about 10 feet across and the drainage off the roads went down through here. And you can see this, the way that these blocks butt up against the, uh, the upstream side. The south end of the main dam near completion. These guys are Port of Water Supply engineers or inspectors to make sure everything gets done properly. Curious that this guy is the only one working. <laughs> Closing the conduit was a major effort. They made some big forms outside and inside. When they made the, the design, there was a chamfer, or not a chamfer, actually a, a cut down into the stone into the stone. So these blocks were maybe a foot shallower in depth than the ones that went on the outside of the dam. So there was kind of a lock. So the, uh, the concrete would lap over 
the masonry of the, of the ark inside. This is looking at the inside of the ark. And this hole was just a drainage hole until they were closing it. The outside, you can see there were some stanchions here and timbers would go across this to block off when they said, okay, we're closing the dam, they could drop it off. But they had to wait until there was a very low flow of water going through the reservoir. I think it was sometime in September when it's kind of dry in the Catskills. So that's when they did it. Then it took two days of continuous pour of making concrete, running it by a cable way, mules, however they could get it into these, this form, pouring it in the top and filling up the gap between the inside piece and the outside piece. And it was about a six, eight foot thickness. Then, it came, then they came back at the end of the dam and then filled that up from the outside down below. Here's the top of the dam. And when they were done, they put railroad tracks across it. It's, the quarry is right back up on this hillside here. So rather than running three miles all the way around, they were able to run track right across. And that quarry also supplied a lot of the bluestone. Have anybody ever been to the Shokan? The inside water, the water side of the dam has bluestone laid perpendicular to the slope. That was all laid by hand and they called it paving. And they paved six miles of dike and wings that way. This picture I bought off of eBay, it's holding down the last block. And you look at the faces of these guys and they all look like the all Italian workers, but the dress is unique. Some of them are kind of like street clothes. They all wore jackets, they all, ha all had a cap of some type or another, no hard hats. This guy's standing, this is the outer edge and the wall edge goes up here. Standing on a board, not safety, safety harness, nothing. You're just now. People have mentioned, talked to me about another number of people killed. No question they were. But the, the only information I was able to find was in the back of one of the books from the Board of Water Supply. Said when they completed this dam, was the completion of the project that took Catskill water to New York City through the Kensico Dam and the aqueducts. And I think 302 or 300 people from that whole project died on the job. So it wasn't bad at all. Now, how many maimed, broken hands and that sort of thing, I, I don't even wanna guess. Now, this is a the lower dam with the, the gates, the shelves down here. And th this was the opening that had to be closed up. The conduit went through here and then they filled this. When you're standing at the dam, you can go lean over and look down at this area. You can't really tell this is a series of steps because this is the old, the Sopich Canyon that ran through there. Canyon is maybe 30, 35 feet deep, but it's a very rustic piece of bluestone. So you can read the numbers. They, I think they did an incredible job with the kind of tools that they had working two shifts and 27 months. The other thing that happened had they were partway into this, the uh, state said, you can't work any more than 40 hours a week. So they had to put on more people in order to compensate for that. And they did two shifts uh, as part of that, but they uh, managed to do all this. Now, just for fun, there's 5,330 square yards in the football field. So divide 5,330 into 40,000. That's how many football fields you'd need to go one cubic yard high. You'd, you'd be close to 80. So it's a, it, it's a big, big, big project. Okay, that builds the dam. The dikes were started almost at the same time they started the dam. And they had to dig those down to bare rock or real, real hard, hard pan. And they tested that to find out whether they, it was safe enough to, to build a dike on. Then they made forms and, and poured concrete into a core wall that was fastened to bedrock 
and then up as high as was necessary to build the deck to hold the water back on the uh, lower and the lower basin. But again, they moved the fill by cableway, narrow and standard gauge railroad because that's a lot of fill to go from this wall out on an, about a 30 degree angle and pack it. And they packed it to uh, six inches on the thickness on the outside and four inches thickness on the inside to make sure there would be no uh, penetration of the water to getting up to the core wall. Beaver Kill Dyke, you can see how high they built the core walls. The Beaver Kill Dyke went down through here. And they, this was the, the rock layers that were in there. And they found that as they were cleaning this out, the water was up, up here. And they had to dig it all down and treat it the same way as they did the main dam. They put a hole through the, the part of the, of the dike. And then when they were ready to close it, they, they just closed it. And then the, the little bit of water that formed behind here in the lower basin was not 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 a real problem. So again, it's just a lot of more, put some dirt down, flatten it, pack it, go back and do the same thing the next day. And they, they had camps on the south side of the reservoir or away from the main camp and they had a camp down on the lower east uh, east end of the reservoir somewhere i'm guessing near where the reservoir in is now on the bottom of, of the reservoir but it was strictly a lot of labor a lot of uh, handwork in uh, getting it done all the rock that came with any of the soil was raked out and put over on the edges. And that was covered with uh, topsoil or, or clay if it was on the water side. This is the water side of this dike. This is called paving. Probably the most ungodly job I could ever imagine. Getting an, a dump load of bluestone dumped up here, bring it down and stack it all day long. What are you gonna do tomorrow? And I think I'll take the day off. Yeah, right. <laughs> but finished dikes are, uh, they had bluestone walls around them, nice roadway on the top, and the bluestone walls came out in 73, and they have regular guide rail type steel bars around there now. Primarily because this is fairly narrow, 26 feet wide, is a little narrow for a two lane road in today's environment. Okay, they had to move the UND out of there. This was kind of fun because Cook and all had the Board of Water Supply over a barrel. New York law says you can't disturb the railroad property until the claim is settled. So they, uh, they worked hard and in, in the course of a year, they said, uh, okay, we'll pay to, to do, get the work done, Board of Water Supply. We'll give you 2.8 mil and we'll have the, we'll have the, you can have, uh, have the railroad running on the new site in uh, June of 1915. Funny, it was just two years it took to get that done. But they had to build special tunnels through the dike so they can continue building the dikes while the trains were still running, bringing supplies to the dam and all. And not only with the train being materials, spent coal, but it also brought all the foodstuffs up from Kingston to uh, to the commissaries. They had to feed these seven, eight thousand people that are there. So what they did was move it up. The track came up here. The reservoir in is a restaurant come almost underneath the, the that part of the W, and follows around and goes up this way. Now, in the last two years, since the uh, county of Ulster took over the uh, railroad, they've turned this into a walking trail or a biking trail from about here all the way up to here. And it is, this part is, you can walk a little bit of it and you get this, this part of the dike. And then it's kind of in the woods. The middle part is all in the woods, but this, the upper part 
if you have nothing else to do and you have want to get out and get some exercise, go up here. It's it's just a very almost a flat, slightly slightly downhill going this way, but not much. And it was all the way along. This is about two miles from where you start here to about here, and you're in the woods for a ways. But it's probably one of the prettiest places you'll see, and it's it's well worth taking the time. These are the access ports that were built. They had to build, basically build a special tunnel. Here's that dike we were looking at before on the beaver kill, looking at it from the other side. There's a cable way bringing materials out, soil probably, or, or cement to go in and fill the masonry over all this. They did not use any cyclopean masonry here. They just continued to make pores. And just a couple other access ports. There's always, up until probably 1911, there were a lot of visitors that came to the reservoir to see what was going on. And Conference of Mayors was held in Kingston. So get on the train and come up and see what's going on up there and have lunch at the cafeteria. OK, the head works. And the main reason that you build this thing is to get water someplace. So they had two basins, the upper basin, the west basin, and the east basin. This, the upper basin, west basin, was three feet higher than the, other, the lower, primarily just to be a collecting basin of the uh, quality of the water. Again, built exactly the same way as the dikes were built down to a base bedrock, pour the, the mold, make the forms. They used a lot of carpenters and they let it, had good carpenters to make all these forms. They were designed in, in three and they could pick it up and move the forms over with the derricks and move them over here. So it's the same forms that they had here and just stagger and work their way across. Here you can see these are the spillways and then these are the stanchions that, held, that holds the roadway that's over there now. You can see the forms, a lot of lattice put over the top of forms, and then they poured concrete over the top of that. And look at this, they, even in the, this period, they took time to think about what the thing would look like rather than just a block, plain block face, they poured concrete that had a little bit of relief to it. And then when you're done, you had a pretty nice looking bridge, but the cableways again, perfect example of why you use it, because you can move concrete from there out all the way across here to all the, the roadway. And then with the continu continuing the work, just building the, uh, the roadway across, here they're putting in the poured concrete, re-rod and all, they pour alternate sections tie these, put these re-rods in, and then tie, then pour these sections. Then over the top, they would, uh, they put sand for the roadway. For temporary, I, 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 I think it's, may, it's probably layers of uh, asphalt in there now. This is the uh, sluiceway gate. That's the only gate that's, there's four of them, that used to go between the water, between the upper and the lower basin, if it doesn't spill over the, the spillway. And that's back in this area. This is the corner of the dike going about to where if you drive across the dividing weir, you have to make a hard left turn and go down a ramp. You used to be able to drive across to the right and go over to, uh, to the west dike and then cross over a little island. And that island, or not an island, but a point. And that point is where the backside of that, there's a monument on the top of that to, to McClellan. That monument was also the zero point for all the survey work that was done. And this is a, one of the cars. I don't know how these work other than very well, that they could dump from either side of the track, the, the, the load that's on here. So they would load it up with soil, bring it over and just a simple lever and the load would drop off to either side. These are the mule wagons that are brought up. The story goes that the 
Nobody in the Catskills knew how to drive a mule wagon. So Winston sent emissaries down south and asked guys, you want to come north and drive your mule, drive mule wagons? And they had probably 200, 250 black drivers and black families that came up and worked on the reservoir. All they did was drive mules here to here, dump it back over to get another load. They didn't load the wagon. They had the Italian laborers that loaded the wagon and they just moved the soil that was dumped off on it. It's all part of the, the packing of the water side of the, of the uh, dike. This is a tight contrast con map of the dikes and the dividing where the, the, there's a channel that runs from the bottom of the reservoir through all the soil up to the intake gates. And there's, a, and there's about a mile long one on the uh, on here. So even at the lowest water level, water could be brought into the gates and down into the lower gate chamber and then to the aerators, which we don't use anymore, and then off to the, uh, the aqueduct. The headworks, the gate chambers, the gatehouses are identical in uh, just mirror images of each other facing the water. And these are the channels that were dug down through the rock and, and the clay to give it full access to all the gate chamber, gate inlets. And there were valves on each of those to, depending on what the water looked like. They could take water off the top or the bottom in the uh, lower uh, basin. You could get it off the, uh, probably all of them because they were all good clean water. And then the water came in down through two dike, two uh, holes that they bored, actually mined in hard rock mining into the uh, basin and concreted the inside to get the shape of the, of the dam. Here's the sluice gates open. Here's one of these red letter cards that I mentioned earlier. Same with this. And the, uh, no, this is one of the BS series. And you can see the, the work that goes on in, in making these things are just your, your hard rock mining, drilling, drilling holes, breaking it down, pulling out the, the small pieces of rock and do it again. Plumbing headworks, I've tried to figure this out and they have so many valves and so many shunts. I, I didn't want to go into it, so I didn't. It just, it took forever to try and figure out the flow of water and it's probably people in the Board of Water Supply Office in Kingston could tell me, but it wasn't worth the effort. Remember those big tubes, big pipes? They saved them to go here. They have plumbing from the uh, area, from the dividing weir down from the lower gate chamber into the aerator basin. And the aerators were put on to, uh, they thought at the time, spraying the water in the air. And it's true, the UV light from the sun would sterilize the water and kill all the bacteria that was in the water. And it, it also improved the taste so they didn't need any chlorination. Now they're chlorinating the water in Croton and in the, they're also putting chlorinators up on the uh, intake at uh, the shell can, primarily because the aqueduct is forming a film on the inside that's slowing down the water as it runs against the side. So they're going through emptying the aqueduct and they have a troop of guys going in and cleaning the inside. They actually have machines that clean it and then they're refinishing the inside of the aqueduct, all 90 miles of it, and then they'll chlor chlorinate the water and that'll make the water move faster with the uh, film removed. And then they also took the aerators out back in the 70s for a uh, electric generation plant. So this is just some of the plumbing that's being done in the aerator basin. So this is still the uh, work almost finished. We're still working on the dam. 
going through here in the aerator basin is, is about done. The lower gate chamber was a unique build. They put in all the plumbing first, then they built a building over the top of it. So that's what it looked like when everything was going full tilt. There used to be a group of uh, residents of the, of the valley that would get together every Labor Day. And I think there's probably three or four of them left. So they decided they're, they're not worthwhile getting together. Most of them are pretty elderly now that would uh, get together and talk about the reservoir. But at the time they had over a thousand mules pulling those wagons. This is from what I can gather, the wagon that is here at the museum. It's a made by Eagle Company and it has drop bottoms and the soil can just fall right out of the bottom as the driver moves along. This is the mule barn. At one time, the uh, barn caught fire and probably 20 or 30 mules died. The uh, very conveniently, Winston from his farm up in Saugerties was able to drive down 30 or 40 mules that he grew up there, sell them to the business, and uh, they were back in operation with, with mules again. All kinds of different tractors. This was rather interesting, digging into this stump puller guy. The only information I had was just the information on the card and the pictures and did a little bit of digging. This was a precursor of the Caterpillar Company. This guy's out of business. They, they tried to uh, uh, over, overland railway kind of system and it just didn't work. You're going across all kinds of different terrain, mud, hard pack, rock. It was easier to put in a narrow gauge railway and do it that way. All kinds of steam shovels, various sizes. And these were true steam shovels. They had a fire going with coal that would develop the steam and they would bring wa a wagon with water over and uh, get, keep the steam up for the guys. Like I mentioned, standard and narrow gauge railway, these little dinky engines, but they haul real well. And those dump bottom cars. And these saddle tank engines are, are great because the water sits on both sides of the, steam, of the boiler and you don't need to have a water tank or a tender behind, the coal sits in the front and the, the engine can go work as well forward or backward and it doesn't have any impediment in the uh, use of the engine. This is a trellis they had, a trellis, tr uh, trestle going over to the quarry. And then as the water came up during a couple of times in the flood, Reservoir wasn't ready yet, but uh, they had the water. Their linkerwood cables, waste, wonderful tools. This is the main concrete plant where the cement came into buildings. The powerhouse was here that generated the steam that turned, made compressed air, that turned all the equipment. Everything worked on compressed air, including the rock crusher. This had to be the noisiest place in the world. Jerks were all built on site. They were lifting engines. They were ran on compressed air as well. And then the rotation of the derrick boom, there, the support posts were held in boxes of stone so they wouldn't pull out through the base underneath those. And the power plant, again, coal burned, made steam, steam turned the, gener the turbines. Oh, by the way, those that pole, picture of the flywheel that was they were made in three pieces loaded on tra uh, train cars and brought up by UND put back together as one big circle so 120 degree section was bolted together and made into the flywheel here you can see that big flywheel working and then the uh, the back of the cement plant the homes were provided $20 a month and that included your meals. 
and they had support for all the workers you needed. They built homes for dorms. They had cottages for families. And like I mentioned, there were new, newly uh, arrived immigrants. And they had a police force that as people grew, a number of people grew, disagreements occurred. This uh, picture I love. This is the Italian camp. Everything is growing on the Italian camp. They had, they, they had gardens and everything. But when, when you're working only eight hours a day, plus the time it takes to walk over to the job and time to walk home, I don't know what people did for lunch. They, they, if they took a break and went to the cafe, went to the mess hall, or if they had lunch delivered to them on the job. I, I've never seen anything about that. All the streets in the camp were named. I have a map of the of the camp just shows where the roads were and but i've not been able to identify the roads but the camps these are little cottages they're all built out of uh, rough cut wood covered with uh, like a tar paper material on the sides inside and out and they're they're made very conveniently a couple of bedrooms, a kitchen, a living area, and the privy is outside. The water from your kitchen flowed through the privy and out through the sewer system that went down to a giant septic system and into Leakesfield at the bottom of the hill. So everything, sanitation was very, one prime concern. They needed to keep these people happy and healthy. These are the, uh, looking at, if you're standing on the top of the main dam, you're looking over at a hillside. McC the McClellan Monument is back over in here. And these are the dining hall and the, the dormitories. And the, here the soil is all scalloped. And these are guys working on just finishing up. But this is the bottom of the camp area where the, the dorms, this was the, the mess hall with the, the people that worked there living in quarters up above. They had schools. Like I mentioned earlier, the adults were taught English. And they, they had, this was the original Barn Station School, nowhere near big enough to handle the number of kids. So they built a second school, camp in the wintertime. And they, they worked year round in some of the areas. And, but most of the camp was pretty much deserted in the wintertime. Payday, here's the bank, the windows across here. There's a little bit of a commissary in the, in the bank, but there was a pool hall upstairs. Police academy. There's a lot of pictures of the reservoir piece on horses, the great horsemen. They'd stand, two guys on, guy on each horse standing up in the stirrups, another guy standing on their shoulders and the three of them riding around. But the surveyors were always busy. The carriers had other jobs. There was work of just about every type you can imagine when you get a community of seven, 8,000 people. Now this set of pictures, there are a number of them, no information on them at all. They're just real photos of a number of guys dressed up in winter clothes dress shoes and uh, had a heck, heck of a time finding out why they were doing that. And after doing some digging, I got thinking when I was at IBM, we used to go to conferences. So I wondered if the Civil Engineers Society ever had a conference. They do. They had one in New York in 1913. And they brought the guys up as a tour of the reservoir. Talk about civil engineering. This is a, probably as big a civil engineering project as going every, anywhere. So they crawled around the reservoir all day long. They were served a very fancy lunch. A friend of mine who's a postcard dealer had this top card. And we sat and looked at that for the longest time. Why on earth were there? This is not a Sunday meal for the workers. This is, this is something a little bit fancier. And that's what it turned out to be. I, I, had to sign on to the Civil Engineer Society in order to get access to their archives. And it did, started crawling through them 
and found out about the, the trip. How they came up and back and forth, I, I surmised in the book, they probably came up on the day line and took the UND train up to the, the reservoir. And maybe they came up by rail from New Jersey. How they got to New Jersey, I don't, I don't remember. But uh, they could have done it a couple of ways. But there were a lot of activities. They had a YMCA, a Boy Scout troop was formed that taught English. Baseball was a big thing. In the, the little booklet uh, called a Shokan, they talk a lot about the baseball team between the, the workers, the Board of Water Supply Engineers, the local towns around. So they had a good time. A friend of mine lives in Fleischmann's, which is over the mountain, and he's part of a uh, antique baseball team in Fleischmann's. They all wear old uniforms and played by the old rules, old equipment. And day off. Uh, vendors were not supposed to come on site. And this picture on the day off is probably not on site because no alcohol is allowed. You would be fired if you were, if you had alcohol on site. Water boy, there's a lady named Diane Galusha who worked for Board of Water Supply in Kingston, put together a very nice book on. Uh, the reservoir and at an interview about a guy whose grandfather was a water boy and he made a dime a day and he gave the mother to his mother money to his mother because what could he do with it there's certainly no places to spend money and here these guys look like they have a might might have a beer in their hands and they're playing cards which again were not allowed on the site but i love this picture the Board of Water Supply is having a uh, Saturday afternoon uh, clam bake. Look at the guys there standing around enjoying their clam bake, except this guy and this guy. They're not hanging out with their buds. <laughs> They're waiting to catch the train to go into Kingston. It's a Saturday afternoon. I'm, I'm leaving it. <laughs> and it, it only was 40 cents, I think, something like that. And at that time, I don't know what that turns us in the dollars today, maybe a couple, but it's only 15 minutes going down. And I have the timetables in the first part of the book, 15 minutes going down and 20 minutes coming back because of the hill. But uh, it was a lot of communication via rail. On October 11th, 1913, they sealed the upper basin. They had a celebration for the upper basin sealing. And the menu, kind of hard to read, but they had fried chicken and pickles and soft drinks and beer. It was the only time they've had beer on the site. And they had it on the top of the dam, which was a great thing. I don't know what an Ashokan cocktail was. And green apple pie and ice cream and cake. So it was a, it was a great celebration. However, October 11th, in this area can be nasty and it looked like it was a kind of a nasty day but all the guys with suits were up front and all the workers went back across the, the, the dam and this is the south end of the dam here so this is what came out came in seven million under budget and came in under schedule they bought almost 2,900 parcels of land. And it did cost us a little bit more for the eight hour workday because they, and they also added a police force. Now, Old West Hurley, it's a little uh, paperback, eight and a half by 11. It's a wonderful little book. It uh, talks about a a wagon ride from Kingston up to West Hurley, which is the first town going up the hill. And it took a half a day by wagon. Water for a city. Wigner was, I think, a legislator in New York State from uh, Olive Bridge. Wonderful, wonderful book with a lot of details in it. And Shooting's Last of Handmade Dams is probably the, the best easy read. He was a professor at uh, New Paltz. Liquid Assets is a book Diane Galusha put together. And this is uh, 
a kind of an architectural book, but it's 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 quite good. Should be able to find those in libraries. Digital archives you can find anywhere. Library should have this around here. It, it's a great DVD. Guys put it together a few years back. And a good friend of ours who has passed now, but he supplied a lot of the postcards that are used in, in this. So that's the reservoir and complete. Now, one other thing. Remember these statistics? I, I just sat down. A jug of water is the roughly six inches square. Car parking space is nine feet wide. Line up 100 jug, you need 11 spaces. Make 100 rows, it'll be roughly 50 by 50 feet. And you get 100 by 100, that's 10,000 gallons of water. It takes up 50 by 50 square feet. Take 100 of those groups together, you get a million jugs. That's only a million. A billion is a thousand of these things. And then a trillion is a thousand billions. And that's what they're talking about in the government, trillions. So get an idea where your dollar fits into this picture. But I, I just started putting that together and that's a bunch, big bunch of numbers. But anyway, you get a chance. That's what the new guide rails look like.